Aye. Projectile motion. If we have a beautiful parabola, then what force is acting on this as it's flying through the air? Gravity. The weight of the object. The weight of the object. The weight is caused by gravity's acceleration, but the weight of the object is the only force that's actually acting on this. Now, yes, air resistance does act on it, but we ignore air resistance because we're not going that high or that fast in speed that we're pretending that it makes a vacuum. <clears throat> if we look at this beautiful parabolic trajectory and we label a couple points, Let's say we label these three points. If we look at A and B and C, and A and C are equally high off the ground, where are we traveling fastest? A and C. I got what point am I? Oh wait, wait. Oh no, C, C. It would be C. Right. Kind of just. It kind of depends on the distance. A and C are going to be traveling equally fast, and B would be slower than A and C are. Now, if we look at just horizontally and vertically, if we look at only horizontal, who is traveling faster? They're all the same. They are all the same because horizontally we travel at a constant constant velocity. So A and B and C horizontally all have an equal sideways component, whatever size that is. So these are all going to be equal. Now, vertically, who's going the fastest? A and C again are going to be tied because if they're the same height up and down, then this one has speed going up and this one has speed going down, but the component size is going to be the same at both of those points. What is going to be the vertical velocity at point B? Zero, so at the highest point it's B. Now, where do we have the highest acceleration? A. B. No, wait. B. No. It's C, right? Wait, horizontal? But no, the acceleration is always there. Hey, the acceleration is always there. What acceleration is always there? The acceleration due to gravity. So what's the acceleration at A? Negative 9.81 at B, negative 9.81 at C, negative 9.81. It's going to be the same everywhere, everywhere, everywhere in that trajectory. So that part never, never, never changes. Now, we started off, and we started off <clears throat> really that fundamental that I just explained there. That's the most important thing that they want you to understand on the test. Gravity is your only force. The acceleration is due to gravity, or weight caused by gravity is the only force acting on it. The acceleration due to gravity is the acceleration all the way through it, and vertical velocity at the top is zero. If you know those things, then you, you make them happy. Other things that you make them happy are understanding how if a ball is rolling this way off of the table, they want you to know how things fall. and um, when we do the open-ended problems, a lot of times, like I said, they're multidisciplinary. You may have momentum tied in with something else, tied in with friction, tied in with parabolic trajectories, but they show up almost every single problem. And so they really like you to understand and calculate how that goes. So again, what we should understand is that horizontally, we are traveling at a constant, constant speed. Or constant velocity and vertically we are accelerating due to gravity so those are the things that mess with us so when you see a nice parabolic shape of course it's really made up of both of these motions happening at the same time so if you kind of graph it out you'll notice that the sideways component is the same, but the vertical component is getting bigger because bigger I'm accelerating. If I was going up, it would look the same way on the other side. So if we had the, the full parabola, we would see it getting smaller and then bigger. 
and again sideways it's always always the same so if we're going at a constant velocity horizontally then what's our one and only constant velocity formula uh, v equals d over t okay so we have v equals d over t and this is the only thing that we can use for horizontal so normally we're looking for d so we bring t up and if we do that again Sometimes it can get confusing because sometimes we have d's that are going up and down, sometimes we have d's that are going side to side, same thing with velocity. So we like to stick the little h's on them just to mentally tell ourselves, hey, horizontally this works, so I can't stick a vertical d in there and make this work because vertically I'm accelerating. Mm -hmm. So if I'm accelerating vertically, I don't want to put that in. So here I'm going to have dh equals dht. And again, the only thing I can plug into this equation is a horizontal velocity and a horizontal displacement. Otherwise, it's going to mess with me. Now, vertically, since I'm accelerating, then the formulas, I can use any of the acceleration formulas. So I can use at squared over 2 plus dit. I can use, well, yeah, let's use the one without time. These are the two that we tend to use the most often. And again, what's the acceleration in both of these? Yeah, so we can change the A into a G. And if I'm just looking at how high I'm going to the highest point, in the first formula, we don't always use this to the highest point. We use that one whenever we have a time. And it may be a time that, like I'm shooting something through the air and I give you a random time and you have no idea where in this arc it is. It could be here, it could be here, it could be here. But in this one, if we use this equation, we can use this to figure out the distance to the highest point. Because we know when we get to the highest point, what's the final velocity going to be? Zero. Because again, we're looking at these only up and down. If we're looking only up and down, these d's are vertical. The acceleration is due to gravity. And the vi is really the vi, initial vertical velocity. So we change those into that to remind myself, again, I, I only worry about how fast they're going straight up and down. And so those come in handy. Now, again, if we go back to the ball rolling off the table problem that we started talking about a minute ago. <clears throat> if we're talking about the ball rolling off the table, I have a velocity that I'm going, but what kind of velocity do I have? That's a horizontal velocity. So initially I'm going... Nothing, only horizontally, but vertically I'm going nothing. So if I have no initial vertical velocity, this will go away. And so if I know how far I fall, say this is 14.3 meters, well, this would be my dv. And again, what does d stand for? Not distance, but displacement. What does displacement have that distance doesn't? A direction. In what direction is this going to go? Down. So this should be a negative value, which is helpful for later. So if we're looking at this equation, we're looking for how long it's going to take for this thing to fall. The fact that it's going sideways doesn't matter. The sideways part does not affect the downward part. So downward, all, all that matters is how far I fall. So if I'm looking for this, I can rearrange this for time. So the 2 comes up and the g comes down, and I end up with 2 dv over g, and that will give me t squared. So the 2 came up, g came down. That gave me t squared, so to get rid of that, I have to square root it. So again, this works only when the vvi was 0, and the vvi was 0 only when I'm falling down. So this is the time down equation that works out great. If I go up initially, I can't use this except for at the highest point down. Because again, the VVI has to be zero on that. So that's where we got that part from. So if we plug that in, of course, we're going to have 2 times 14.3 over 9.81. Now, the reason I was harping on this has to be negative is because that negative has to cancel that negative because when you try and square root it, it makes your calculator sad. And it says error, ver, ver. So when you plug this in, you would get 
Four point seven one. Yeah. And so then, if this ball was rolling at say ten point three meters per second, then how far over is it going to go? Well, now that we know a time and we know a horizontal velocity, we can stick both of these in here and figure out how far over it fell. So that would go over 17.6. And that's where we first saw it on the ground. That's one type of problem. Very easy problem. They expect you to know how to do that sort of thing. Be able to find the time now, plug that in. <coughs> If, on the other hand, we're looking for, say I gave you, we have something sitting on a table and it's rolling off the table and it rolls down. Now, if I tell you how far over it goes and I tell you how fast it was going, then I give you a dh and a vh. If I give you a dh and a vh, then we could solve for t. t. So the vh would come down over here and we could solve for t, then once we know the t, we could plug it into there and figure out how high the table was. If it's rolling straight off a horizontal table, then the vi is zero and that part still drops off. But what if it doesn't? What if it's not going off a table like that? What if we're throwing it up in the air? So that was the other type of nerdishness that we did was if we launch it at some velocity at some angle, if we launch it at a velocity at a given angle, then we can break this triangle into two pieces. Both of them have to be Vs, of course. So the one going sideways is horizontal, the one going vertically is vertical. Um, the horizontal one is constant, so it just stays VH. But the initial one is accelerating, which means it's gonna get smaller and smaller on the way up and then bigger and bigger back on the way down. So this is just the initial vertical velocity here, because this is horizontal. Now again, if these two numbers are given, then this side, we say, hey, that's the opposite side and the hypotenuse. So over here, we're going to use the sine of the angle times the hypotenuse would give me VVI. And over here, it would be the cosine of the angle times V would give me the VH. Mm -hmm. And so once I know that, if I just give you a velocity at an angle, you can break it into components like that. And of course, the VH plugs into the dh equals vht problem, and this one is going to plug into the dv equals dv squared over 2 plus the dvit. So this answer goes in there, this answer would go there. And if I gave you a t, no problem, we got it made. If I don't give you a t, then you say, well, how can I find t? This is going up, not down, so we need a time up formula. And again, if I'm just worried about how high does it go until it gets to the highest spot, then I know my VVI is the initial at the bottom. I'm going to go up until I eventually stop and start falling down. And I know that gravity is my acceleration in between these. So I have a VF and I have a VI and I have a G and I'm looking for T. I just use the acceleration formula. So A equals VF minus VI over T. But then the T and the A are going to trade places. So A comes down here, T is here. So again, since this is gravity, this is going to be my T up equation. Again, I'm going to go up until my VF is zero. So this could just replace by zero. And this V is really the VVI. So the component that I get here will go in here. Now, if I'm flying through the air, of course, the time up only gets me to my highest point. I could plug into the time down equation after figuring out the height, but it's a whole lot easier to just say time up equals time down. So if I just say time up times two, that'll give me my total time. Yeah. So that works as long as I'm landing at the same height that I took off from. On the other hand, if I'm up here and I shoot and land down here, then time down clearly is bigger than time up. Or if I'm at the bottom throwing something up to somebody up on high, then my time up is bigger than my time down. So if I do that, I can't multiply by two. I have to figure it out using the two different formulas. So, yeah. And what I showed you last year is that if we are landing at the same height that we took off from, then 
since the time up equals the time down, what we can do is instead of plugging into all these separate different formulas, what we normally just care about is how far we went, our dh. And so I give you a magic handy dandy formula to combine all the formulas. And so if you just know the, excuse me, if you just know, <laughs> if you just know the v and the angle and nothing else, you can figure out how far it's going to go. So that formula is going to be the sine of twice the angle. That does not say 20. It says twice the angle times the v squared over a positive g. And what happens is the time up formula is built into there. And since we have 0 minus the vvi, we end up with a negative up here that cancels out the negative that's in g. So in this equation, the g ends up being positive yeah, all the time. On the same thing, like Correct. That only works when we're landing at the same height that we took off from because the idea that time up times 2 is built into that equation. So if we're in a situation like this, then we cannot use that equation. So this equation only works when we're landing at the same height. But if you're playing soccer and you kick a soccer ball through the air, no problem. You're playing catch with somebody, no problem. And it works out great for things like that, which is a lot of parabolic motion. So that will work out. Any questions there? Okay, the last, those are pretty much all the formulas that we use. The only other concept that really came out that you should understand are angle stuff. Um, if we throw at a low angle, then it doesn't stay in the air very long and it doesn't go very far. If I throw with the same speed but a higher angle, then I'm in the air for longer, so I go farther. If I throw at a higher angle, it'll go even farther. If I go at an even higher angle, it'll go higher, but not as far because most of my energy is going up instead of sideways. And what we find is that there are angles that end up landing at the same spot, one that has a low trajectory and one that has a high trajectory. And what we find is the angles that land at the same spot, again, this is assuming we're landing at the same spot we took off from, these are going to be complementary angles. So if this low angle was 30, then the high angle would be 50. So the angle that goes the farthest would be 45. 45, because 45 is its own complement. That is the one that's going to end up going the farthest. So if, if you're trying to go for big distance and air resistance is not a big factor, then yeah, 45 degrees is always what you want to watch. So if you're going a low trajectory, of course, it's in the air for a shorter time period. If you're going in the high trajectory, it's in the air for a longer time. High trajectories are obviously better for going over trees and things like that, too. So there's different advantages for going to different things. But if you understand that the two angles that will land at the same spot are complements, that's kind of helpful. Now, of course, they act differently when they hit the ground. If I go with a low angle that hits the ground, what it's going to do is most of the energy is going sideways. It's going to continue to roll. If I have a high one, then it'll kind of hop and stop because more of the energy is coming straight down. So what's going to happen to the ball after it hits will be different if, it, if it's a ball that we're throwing. Of course, if it's an arrow or something, it's going to stick in the ground no matter what. So yeah. And of course, none of this works for disc golf because disc golf is not projectile. We do not fly a parabolic trajectory. Yeah, all kinds of funky things going in disc golf. They're complicated now. Any questions? Okay, then.